Good day. Today we have Jacob Russell. Kindly, if you can introduce yourself. Absolutely. So yeah, like you say, I moved to Lebanon in 2015. I'm from the UK originally. I'm a journalist. Uh, initially, I was a photographer, a photojournalist. Mm -hmm. In Lebanon, a uh, crisis hit. It coincided with cryptocurrency bull market. The level of interest that that generated inside Lebanon, I came across it as a journalist, not knowing anything about cryptocurrency. Really. And so I started covering it out of a general journalistic interest in things that were happening in uh -huh. Lebanon. I went down the rabbit hole and became fascinated by the subject, the subject of cryptocurrency in economies which are struggling or uh -huh. failing. Do, do you like Lebanon until today? I do. There's many frustrations to living here, for sure, but I do like Lebanon. I've married into Lebanon. I'm, uh, I've been here a long time. It's certainly got its hooks in me. Do you have your cup of tea at noon or Turkish coffee? Coffee. Coffee. coffee every time. Can you tell us a little bit about the research that you've done recently about the mining in general here in Lebanon? I, I heard you did it uh, in a collaboration with uh, some famous university. So in 2022, Research and Story for the Rest of the World, which is a US publication covering uh, technology outside of, uh, in inverted commas, the West. I did it in collaboration with a friend and colleague called Adam Hassan, mm -hmm. who uh, is a PhD at the University of uh, California. Berkeley. And we uh, set out to find out the scale and nature of mining operations in Lebanon, mm -hmm. where, which is a really interesting case because when the crisis hit in Lebanon and the lira, the Lebanese lira fell off of its peg, there was a period where government institutions were still conducting their affairs at the formal exchange rate, which meant that if you were dealing in dollars, electricity was extremely cheap. And for a period, there was a kind of explosion of mining because and Lebanon's a very connected country and once somebody starts doing something and having success, very quickly, word spread. The official rate was then $1 equal 1,500 exactly, yeah. So for the residential bills, we were still paying based on this rate. Which meant even in the early days of the crisis, when, I mean, today a dollar is worth around 90,000 lira. So even in the early days of the crisis, when the dollar was worth, say, 3,000 as opposed mm. to 1,500, you're still paying 50% discount on your electricity bill. So people who had access to computers to do it started doing it. This was quite a brief period because after that, the electricity grid started to collapse. So it was no longer viable to, to mine using the state electricity. Almost free state electricity. The almost free state electricity, which is great if it's there. It was continuous yeah. and <laughs> yeah. reliable. Yeah. Uh, what happened was there's an area in Lebanon called the Shouf, Three it's a beautiful areas. area. It's a very beautiful it's area. Very beautiful it's stunning. Area. Yeah, yeah. And it's served by three hydropower plants. Oh. So even when the electricity grid collapsed, this area continued to receive electricity. So much of the mining that was going on tried to move their operations to the Shouf. So when uh, the electricity grid collapsed in Lebanon, many of the miners moved to the Shouf, ah. uh, where there's a region, there's about 200 villages that are served by three hydroelectric power plants, which were still running. Time. This resulted in a lot of very disparate decentralized miners looking for locations where they could ah. plug into this hydropower. And in each of these villages, you saw a different response from the authorities. So some tried to shut them down and expel them. Some called in uh, the state in the form of the police or uh -huh. other authorities to do that. Other villages are under the de facto control of political actors, which are not subservient to the state. And so it was harder for police to do anything in those places. And there was one village in particular where an enterprise individual managed to coordinate these miners so that they could find locations they would not threaten the stability of the local grid and local residents would even receive rental uh, income from the miners for uh -huh. using their space were they paying uh, commercial or residential uh, rate at first they were i believe paying residential rates as that operation expanded entered into negotiations with the electricity company and some of those operations now are big enough that they have deals with the electricity company which allow them to have private transformers on the property uh -huh. Can we have some quantitative data here? Did your research cover all Lebanon? How many mining farms across mm. Lebanon? Where they are centralized? The hash power of the Lebanese mining farms? Mm -hmm. uh, individuals who are mining in their homes? I know it's, it's super difficult to count them, but mm. in general, if we can have some quantitative uh, data mm -hmm. in order for us to assess the weight. In terms of scale, I'm going to disappoint you and say there isn't definitive data. In terms of global hash rate, which is a measure of the amount of of computing power on the Bitcoin network. What comes out of Lebanon is negligible. And in fact, if you look at Cambridge University has a website which measures hash rate and it's zero global hash rate. In terms of the global scale, it's not, not a phenomenon that has really any impact on the 
mm. on the Bitcoin network. It's more interesting in the impact it has socially inside Lebanon and the dynamics that it produces between the miners and local authorities and local population. Again, uh, in terms of scale across the country, at this point in 2023, the electricity prices have gone up. The electricity company has adapted its prices to the new exchange rate and it's still not reliable enough. But, but also we saw that there was a spike or a revolution in installing solar panels and people depending mm. on the solar uh, systems. Do you think now those miners are using the solar power? To... Anecdotally, I have heard of people using solar power. It's not an efficient way to power a farm of any decent size. Mostly people who use solar power are people who have extra capacity from their panels. They find they have a bit of extra capacity, so they put a miner onto their, onto their little mini grid. But you can't power your mining farm during night unless you have a lot of storage capacity. Exactly, there. yeah. Um, and decent storage capacity is expensive, and so super. that affects your, your margins and not really a viable way to do it. At the moment, most of the mining that's happening in Lebanon is decentralized in the sense that it doesn't belong to a company or an institution. However, there are a few major players, I think, who are responsible in some way or another for most of the mining that's happening. They might not own the machines, but there are a few people who are capable of setting up large farms. So even when new actors enter and say, I want to get involved in mining. So they will need they, their they, consultants. Exactly, yeah. They don't have the technical capacity to, to set it up. So they will call in uh, those consultants. These few consultants. So I had a question in my mind to ask about the comparison or the scale of Lebanese hash power uh, mm. compared to the global hash power. And you already answered <laughs> it. It's almost nothing. Mm. And this is a... Uh, disappointing to a certain extent but to, back to uh, 2019 where were those mining farms centralized were they in north in akkar in tripoli were they in balbek in hermel west bika juni beirut khalde mm -hmm. reaching uh, south uh, naura mm -hmm. where were they uh, located or centralized mm -hmm. if there are certain mm -hmm. uh, centralization so in the early days, when it was possible to mine from the main grid, you would find very small scale farms scattered mm. th throughout the country. As the grid collapsed and people kind of gravitated towards sources of power that were affordable or economically viable, it became more geographically centralized. Now the Bekaa is the center south of the country, definitely the Shouf where this hydropower uh, is, still, mm. is still running. So basically at this point, people are either mining off of hydropower, mm. whether that be in the Shouf or anecdotally, I haven't seen any of them, but I have heard stories about private individuals installing small hydropower turbines in rivers and mining from them. Obviously, they are operating in what you might call a legal grey zone. Is this the way of the Lebanese uh, people in adapting with the situation? <laughs> Resilience, yes. <laughs> Always figuring yeah. out how to yeah. survive in the best way. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, certainly, I guess it's an example of that, yeah. yeah. Uh, you had an interview with the financial prosecutor, mm. Ali Ibrahim. Mm. Kindly, can you tell us a little bit about this interview mm. and the conclusion that, yeah, that can benefit us or maybe find some, some mm. light? Some clarity. Air. Some clarity, mm. exactly. Many of the miners that we spoke to during doing this research, as I said, they feel themselves at the time and still feel themselves to be operating in a legal gray zone and this was the quote that came up again and again we're in a legal gray zone the problem is that there has been no real legislation passed mm. regarding cryptocurrency at all and as is often the case in lebanon the state uh, is woefully behind the people in terms mm. of uh, in terms of innovation and adaptation and activity in general However, yeah, uh, I spoke to the financial prosecutor to very directly ask, is this legal? Because the financial prosecutor was in fact involved in shutting down some of the operations in the Shouf when the miners initially gravitated there. And he said there is no law against it and there is no law for it. Mm. It is therefore de facto not illegal and not illegal means legal. So he didn't criminalize this activity at all? Well, his, his words were, you know, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but he was quite clear. He was like, as long as they are obtaining electricity in legal means, uh -huh. it's not illegal. And you wrote this article for? Uh, rest of world. Okay. So from your uh, hands-on experience with those mining farms and individual miners, what was the most popular uh, coins that they were mining? Were they only interested in Bitcoin, altcoins, or maybe they were diversifying? To a lot of people who are not involved in cryptocurrency, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency are interchanged. But in mining, not many people in Lebanon were mining Bitcoin. One of the things that's interesting about hash rate and the scale of mining that's going on here is that Bitcoin is not a very popular coin to mine. 
So for example, somebody I know who is very involved in mining operations here told me that it constitutes about 7%. 7%, 7 only? of his mine. Many of the miners were mining Ethereum before it went to proof of stake. And at the moment, the most popular coins are Litecoin, Dogecoin, and Cadena. And this is simply because they are seen to be more profitable. Uh, uh, what about mining Helium? h &T token, which was super popular mm -hmm. in the recent years. There was a wave of it, yeah, wasn't there? It was a wave, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Helium uh, was supposed to provide a... M may, may I interrupt saying, do you agree that it was a Ponzi scheme? I think the, word, I think the phrase Ponzi scheme is thrown around very easily. Yeah. Okay, I think so that... Uh, I, what, was I, it a scam? I, I, I think it's well and truly a shit coin, put it that way. It's a shit coin, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if it was a scam. There was certainly some, within the Helium project, there was certainly some very dodgy tokenomics mm. going on. But to be honest, that's so common in, uh, in most coins, uh, that, uh, uh, coins projects that I'm not sure if it even constitutes a scam anymore. It might just be the nature of the beast. The Helium was supposed to incentivize people to operate a node on a decentralized wireless network. And if they operated a node which would transmit and receive signals, then they would receive Helium token, um, which at some point was quite profitable when the market was in was bull booming. Mm. It, not only was there a bull market, but Helium itself had a lot of hype around it. Mm. People really thought this was going to break, uh, break new ground and be something really innovative. The, uh, due to the tokenomics, the end of the bull market, some really just fundamental flaws in the project, the price of the token crashed. And at the same time, the amount of the token that you could mine from operating these nodes went down. Mm. In Lebanon, it was very popular because it required very little electricity exactly. and it required a very basic internet connection. And you could essentially buy... And, and very basic knowledge about yeah, it. A little bit of um, capital up front a few thousand dollars. Like I said, at the height of the bull market, you could return your investment very quickly and make some money on it. What was the utility behind this project just to um, replace the traditional legacy GSM uh, Essentially, antennas? yes. Essentially, yes. So in, and in the first stage of the project, the network was uh, suitable for Internet of Things, so you couldn't really send emails on it. Mm. But if, you know, they partnered, for example, with e-scooter firms who would track where their scooters were. Okay. Using it was a project with big ambitions and not an awful lot of follow through, honestly. Okay. In Lebanon specifically, like I said, there was a, a, a wave of people importing these machines in exactly. order to operate them. And though, many of those people lost their uh, initial investment. And, um, okay. But well, do you assume that uh, happened to those mining machines that the Lebanese people bought and they have now? Them. And you know, and this also goes back to the question of scale because it depends how you measure it. You know, you can measure scale of mining operations here by the number of machines, mm. which was something that we did when we conducted the research in, in 2022. They were doing machines and VGAs also. Oh, and VGAs, yeah. Can you share some of them? Off the top of my head, I don't have the specific st uh, statistics, but hundreds of thousands of machines uh, operating at mm -hmm. the time. However, many of those uh, operators have replaced those machines for machines which are much more efficient. Uh -huh. So for example, if you saw a comparison of the number of machines operating in Lebanon now compared to today, you might see a decline. Mm. But those machines are much more efficient. They're producing more hash rate. Mm. So in fact, the effective scale has grown, even though the number of machines has declined. But less people now are, are mining, less so the hash rate will, will be logically less yes and like i say it's it's hard to measure because it's so negligible that it doesn't show up on people like cambridge university who are measuring the global hash rate it just doesn't register in their, in their metrics due to the recent incidents now happening in palestine you know the war and the fear of uh, being spread across here you know, mm. to, to lebanon what would be the effect on the global uh, you know, hash rate mm. and the Bitcoin price uh, in specific? I can make assumptions, but kindly. Mm -hmm. It's a really fascinating question because I think if the conflict were to spread into Lebanon, it would be an awful thing. Of um, course. The infrastructure would be targeted and electricity would be scarce, mm. hard to come by. So you can assume that all mining operations would be at least significantly impacted, if not shut down completely. As Lebanon doesn't contribute really very much at all to the global hash rate, it would have really no impact on the global hash rate if they all shut down. I've spoken to miners who are generally, I have to say, quite fatalistic uh, about it and kind of see, see what happens, hmm. but are making preparations where they are, um, you know, for example, they might operate in Lebanon and also in the Gulf. 
since your arrival to Lebanon in 2015 and until today, how many articles did you write about cryptocurrency and what was your uh, first uh, article about cryptocurrency in Lebanon? 10 to 15 articles uh, on cryptocurrency and associated kind of stories. The first one was an investigation, was how I met you, in fact, and that was an investigation into, into the ecosystem of, of brokers like yourself uh, and how that operates, uh, how that came about, um, and how I interact with the general economy and the general population. So, yeah, the first article was actually one of the biggest in the sense that it was, uh, you know, since then I've written uh, articles about the specific um, why helium doesn't work in Lebanon, for example, mm. which is honestly only people who love cryptocurrency are going to really be interested in that. So a lot of people would be interested to read it because it was about the economy, about the Lebanese mm -hmm. uh, crypto. Uh, yeah, and I think also Lebanon has style, you know, and uh, Lebanon does things with style. Due to the lack of regulation, due to the sort of shaky socioeconomic framework that everybody's working in, you have really fascinating stories and you have the people that succeed are people who have some force of character, not just some, um, not just a good business plan. You know? Whereas in Europe or the US, not so much the US, but in places where you have regulation, you know what the rules are, and as long as you play by them, you're going to sort of get Survive. somewhere. Yeah. yeah. In Lebanon, you don't really know what the rules are, so you have to survive and adapting. Yeah, you have to really. It, there has to be a certain initiative, agility, and, and agility for character and connections to, to mm. carry something mm. forward. Mm. What, what was your recent uh, article about related to recent? cryptocurrency? Yes. So the most recent article I did was about Tron. Justin uh, Sun. Uh, Justin Sun. Justin Sun's Tron. Why the use of Tether on the Tron chain is so ubiquitous in Lebanon. And not just in Lebanon, but in a lot of uh, the developing world. Or, or you know, uh, again, in inverted commas, the developing world. Um, whereas Tron is quite distrusted in, in the States and Europe. And also Tether is quite distrusted as well. Do, do you have any plans to meet any one of those key players like Justin Sun? Paolo Arduino, I mean, if CZ, they come to Lebanon, Binance, then I'll be there for sure. <laughs> Maybe you can have a tele-meeting with them, you know, a Zoom interview. I would love to speak to them. To me, cryptocurrency has two different faces in a way. It has a systemic face, and that is usually originates in the countries where uh, much of the programming and the investment happens i.e. America and Europe and Asia to a greater and greater extent. And I think that there's something about cryptocurrency which lends itself to people who think about big systems mm. and who think about emergent phenomena. So, you know, you set rules and then you see what emerges from people following those rules. And then it has this other face, which takes place in what people often call the developing world, uh -huh. which is very individualistic. Since 2019, I think uh, you said that you have met a lot of, of key players and individuals here related to cryptocurrency ecosystem here in Lebanon. Until today, 2023, do you see this economy expanding or you see it shrinking or maybe maintaining its state now? Mm. Few, few key players are leaving the In court. Lebanon specifically? Yes. I think the mining, I don't see expanding much beyond. I think Lebanon is kind of at capacity in terms of mining. Okay. Both in terms of what the infrastructure can support and also in terms of the individuals who were going to get involved are already involved. Cryptocurrency, I, I see a massive expansion. Uh -huh. see. On which layer? The layer of the usage, mm. uh, people using it? Money remittance. It solves a very obvious problem. Mm. The obvious problem being that the banking system is defunct, to put it politely. In terms of moving money, in terms of remittance, in terms of storing money, moving money. Can yeah. Do you see more businesses now or maybe your eye can like, notice more mm. businesses accepting crypto maybe? Honestly, no. I think that it is happening. I think you still have the effect where you are only really getting people who are from a young internet native and there are a lot of those people here, but the older generation is, is still suspicious. Skeptical about it's this technology. Yeah. Do they, they still trust it, the banks, you think, or, or the government? <laughs> maybe <laughs> maybe the government can, can, <laughs> can bring back the lira to 1,500 exchange rate. I don't think anybody still has that, still has that hope. Maybe people still thinking that they can get their money out of the banks? I'm sure that, yeah, some people are holding on to that. Unfortunately, and you know, this sounds perhaps harsh, but unfortunately, I think the people who are still holding on to that idea are going to be the people who will lose most. And it's mm. the people who have adapted to the idea that that money is gone, who are already making new money.
and a lot of people are making new money in them. To follow up on the point as well about the older generation, even though some of them don't trust cryptocurrency, they still use it to move money. Oh. Mm. And they will just work with a broker that they trust. And they will use cryptocurrency not out of some passion for cryptocurrency, but simply because it's a system which is cheap and functional. So they hop on, hop off so exactly. quickly. Yeah. And so. there's a sufficiently uh, lively ecosystem of people like yourself here so that you don't really need to know too much to mm. get your business done. Mm -hmm. And I see that expanding for sure. And especially when the country, the economy is so reliant on remittance and so much money moves in and out of Lebanon, mm -hmm. um, both clean money and dirty money, as everyone knows. And cryptocurrency is just like money, useful for <laughs> both of those. You, you can use it for, for money remittance for sure, but also for, for investment. It is very useful and fruitful. If you know how to do it, of course. I would push back a disclaimer that. to say that it's mm. high risk, mm. high profit, high loss. I'd push back against the idea that it's uh, for investment. The vast majority of people who trade cryptocurrency lose their money. Well, there's a difference between trading and investing. That's true. That's so true. we are talking here about investing in cryptocurrency, mm. believing in, in some projects, uh, taking the proper moment in history in order mm -hmm. to get into the mm market like for example talking about altcoins slash shit coins if we bought uh, ada which is cardano at one dollar yes we are in loss mm -hmm. but every investor a good investor knows that he had to wait mm -hmm. until it dips that much mm -hmm. so yeah but i Solana, think there's a curve like for bitcoin also a lot of people waited for the correct mm -hmm. moment which is under 20k and they entered mm -hmm. there was a risk for mm -hmm. them to go deeper mm -hmm. but they believed in this mm. technology or in this project. So there's a difference here between day trading, mm. what, what, even if it's weekly trading, mm. but still a trader. I, I, I agree with you, but I think that there's an educational curve when people enter exactly. a cryptocurrency, which is quite long. You know? And in my experience, from knowing nothing to being in a position where mm. I can quite calmly interact uh, and, uh -huh. and make investments and not, okay. you know, and, you know, the it was a good year or so where I would be like have a high heart rate when, I, when things went down and be a bit overjoyed when things went up you know, uh, before uh. you realize that this is not uh, the way. But did to you sell when that. it went up? I certainly lost money for sure. And, and I feel like uh, when the market was booming, did you sell? And, and well, I only discovered cryptocurrency when the market was booming. So I was one of the, <laughs> I, I, you know, I, so I, you... I definitely became a bag holder pretty quick. Thank you for uh, giving us this time. Thank you. And thank you for the information also that you shared with us. Thank you, my friend. Thanks, Thanks. Thank you.